I'm Brian, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Brian. Is that okay? I'm doing it? Okay. I, I got my cell phone in the meeting because there's no clock, um, but I'm not that important to have a cell phone in the meeting, so that's why I have it, though, so I can be reminded of the fact that i got to stop at a certain time, and the guy with the brightest shirt in the uh, room is going to flag me after about five minutes and tell me to shut up. Cause, so. um, I, I, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I never know what to say at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting because, uh, you know, we are some of the most judgmental people in the whole world. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting out there and somebody's up here, you know, my mind is going. Like, who's this goober standing up there? And, you know, he's kind of kind of goofy looking and whatever. But uh, anyways, for the next uh, 50 minutes, I'm going to share my experience, strength, and hope, uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, you know, I, I have this uh, thing, you know, I'll, I'll buy something. I went to uh, Costco and they had this sale on these windshield wipers. You know, I mean, they were like seven bucks for these, you know, pretty, pretty good windshield wipers. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I want to get my money's worth out of everything. You know, my windshield wipers, they were, they were shot a long time ago. But I finally, today, put those brand new windshield wipers on. And guess what? I don't have any streaks in my windshield anymore because I got, you know, I got brand new windshield wipers. But, you know, I don't know about you, but I like to go to the end of whatever it is. And my alcoholism took me to the end of, uh, you know, the fact that I was an alcoholic and I was powerless over alcohol. I like to drink, guys. I did. Um, and you got to trust me on that. I, I haven't drank with anybody in this room. Um, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was just one of those things, that physical allergy that I suffer from. You know, it was inflamed from the very beginning. You know, although I blamed everybody for my problems, it was one of those things. When I put alcohol in my system, I never knew what was going to happen. And I never drank enough. Um, and one of the things that I had to learn in here was that it wasn't about what I did that was the alcoholic behavior. That's drunk behavior. The alcoholic for me, the alcoholic behavior or the phenomenon of craving was when I knew that I didn't want to do that, I did it anyways. You know, that's the alcoholic behavior for me that I had to understand when I got here. Um, you know, I, I got in here when I was 24. And it was one of those things, uh, you know, it hit me hard. And uh, like I said, I never drank enough. Um, I don't know too many people that, that drink double JD and Cokes and a shot chaser on the side and call that social drinking. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't know too many people, you know, that drink socially that get DUIs, you know, and get in trouble with the law and all of those kind of things that I did. Um, but if you ask me why, why, why was I drinking, I would have blamed it on everything else. It wasn't me. It was everybody else's. It's, you know, I'm a victim. I don't know if anybody else suffers from that mentality. You know, I was born to the wrong family, whatever. But, uh, you know, and I always wanted to escape outside of me. You know, I wanted to be different than I was. I wanted to be somebody different. And I always thought everything was better over there. And I don't know where there was. But I always thought it would be different somewhere else. And through the course of my uh, ripping and running, I, I did a couple geographics. You know, because guess what? You know, it's, I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So, you know, some of you guys may know a little bit about the thing that just happened a couple of days ago. <laughs> but uh, that's an outside issue. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm sitting there ripping and running, and then I, you know, I think a good idea is to come out to California, you know, get away from the responsibility in Milwaukee. And, you know, I'm 18 years old. I hadn't graduated from high school. You know, I, was just, I had every excuse why I didn't do that. It was her fault. It was their fault. It was, you know, life's fault. Um, and I come out here, and the same thing. You know, I don't know about you, but I attract those people that drink like I did. I don't, I don't care where I go. You know, if, if you're an alcoholic like I am, we're going to meet up. You know, female, male, it doesn't matter. We're going we're gonna to hook up because I like to drink. You know, and if we're drinking here, you know, let's go somewhere else and drink. And, you know, let's see what we, we can do to get into trouble. Anybody ever get into trouble because of alcohol? You know, I, I've been sober a little while, and I hadn't gotten into any trouble in that respect. You know, I hadn't gotten stopped by the law for drinking and driving or drunk and disorderly. So. But uh, anyways, and then uh, during that whole thing, you know, I went in the Air Force, too. 
because uh, I thought if I got away from Milwaukee, you know, it'd be different in the Air Force. And I don't know about you, but anybody in here serving the military, they drink just like they do in Milwaukee. I mean, it's it's insane. Um, you know, and, and, and again, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, I always wanted to fit in. And when I drank, guess what? I fit in, guys. I mean, I wasn't a geek. You know, I wasn't a nerd. I was just... Whatever happened, happened. And uh, alcohol was the, uh, the elixir that allowed me to do that. So I uh, went in the Air Force and got in trouble in the Air Force uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, you know, if you'd asked me if I believed when I was out there doing what I did, I would have said, yeah, I believe in God, power greater than myself. But there was no action or any... Um, you know, works behind that. It was just, I, I believe, there was an intellectual belief and, you know, they were words that really weren't meaningful. And, uh, you know, I, I remember getting into debates about God and the existence of God. And, you know, when you're drunk, that's easy to talk about that stuff. You know, who's right? You know, let's have another one and talk about God. Um, I actually got uh, thrown out of a bar one time for trying to push my uh, religious issues and I was drunk. I mean... What a what an oxymoron that is, you know. <laughs> and I'm out there, oh, that's he, the God is, you know. Um, so, anyways, uh, all the things that I did out when I was out there drinking, um, that was uh, uh, alcohol behavior, and that's one of the things that I had to learn when I got in here was uh, I drank because I'm an alcoholic and I was powerless over alcohol. That was it, and. Uh, um, to back up just a little bit, I was raised in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my mom used to take five kids to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. She passed away with 43 years of sobriety. She used to bring all of us, you know, because she needed to stay sober and for us to have some kind of quality of life. And she was a bad alcoholic. She almost died from this thing. Um, yeah, the doctor told the kids getting raised or drinking. Guess what she chose? Drinking. And then she finally had to accept the fact that she was powerless over alcohol. So I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to meetings. I went to open meetings. I went to dances when I was a kid. I cleaned the clubhouse. I did all those things. And, uh, you know, is it hereditary? I don't know. But my mom never told me to go out there and drink. She never poured a drink down my throat. I did that all on my own. And uh, for a long time, I blamed that. You know, it's hereditary and it's, you know, their fault. But when I got in here and you guys said, guess what? You're an alcoholic because you drink. You drink too much. And it affects you differently than other people. And uh, what a relief that was when I had to accept responsibility for that. Um, so, you know, again, I went in the Air Force and I went to Hawaii. I was stationed there for two years. And I don't know about you, but, you know, it's it's a whole different world, you know, and in Hawaii than it is here. Um, you know, the, the, it rains a little bit during the day and then the sun is shining all the time and you got that big ocean, you know, surrounding the island. It's just beautiful. And so, uh-oh. Um, so anyways, I remember going with the guys that I worked with and, you know, we had to work three days, three swings, three mids. And after the mid, we would get our break. And what would happen is we would all go to the uh, Waimea Bay and at first it was just you know everybody would go there and they'd be tipping Jack Daniels and I'd look at them and say I ain't ever going to do that and a little while later I'm the one tipping the Jack Daniels and uh, doing the crazy stuff and you know just joining in um, you know some of the experiences that I had over there were uh, you know I was lost I was a lost man you know, in a grown-up world trying to figure out, you know, what is my purpose in life? And alcohol always seemed to be the, the, the thing that allowed me to fit in and be a part of. Um, I remember sometimes sitting on the balcony of the dormitory and, and just sitting there and thinking, what is this really all about? Why am I here? And uh, I would sit on the edge. We were on the third floor. And sit on the edge of the, the balcony, you know, wanting to jump. You know, just saying whatever yeah so it's uh it's one of those things where um you know if you ask me why 
uh, I wouldn't have had an answer other than I don't know. Uh, but I like to drink, though. You know, and if you put a drink in me, I ain't thinking about that other stuff. You know, so uh, had an experience over there. I uh, came to California again. You know, as you know, one of my uh, I was in Hawaii, came to California to visit my brother, and he got sober. And uh, I came in here, and you know, I was here, and you know, he had a great life. He had a lot of outside things, a lot of you know, possessions, and he had a wife at the time. And I came in here and met a little honey, and you know, thought hey, it was great, and. Uh, you know, tried it for a little while, and I was here, what, a month? And I went back to Hawaii and Hawaii and, and got a sponsor and started to go to AA meetings. And, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't changing what I was doing. I was going to the meetings and, you know, hanging out at meetings, but I was still going to the NCO club. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of one of those things. You're either in or you're out, you know, and uh, I wasn't in. I was just kind of like, whatever, you know, I just want to get whatever I can get and, you know, satisfy myself. So anyways, I was going to the NCO club and I hadn't drank. I don't know how long it was, but uh, I was at the bar and there was this girl and she said, you don't drink. And I said, I do now, you know, because that was a higher power for me, you know. So, uh, you know, it, it just it's another example. You know, I had no effective mental defense against the first drink, no matter who was around me. Even though I was going to AA and I saw my brother and, you know, it was a lot of good things were happening. Um, and there were outside issues in my, my story as well. Being in Hawaii, Pakalolo was, you know, rampant for me. And so, um, anyways, got in trouble, you know, in Hawaii. And, and my uh, reputation followed me back to, or over to England. I left Hawaii and went to England. And I, after I got sober, I didn't realize that the base commander had sent a letter to my incoming commander and said, watch out for this one. You know, and, and my reputation was, you know, I'm a drunk, I'm a loser, I'm going to get into trouble, so watch out. And uh, sure enough, it didn't take long. I got uh, stationed over there in January, and by November 5th, 1986, I had uh, my second... Uh, my second incident, which was a DUI. The first incident was a week before, and I punched an officer in a blackout. And uh, I don't know about, you know, that's a serious offense in the military. Uh, you just don't do that. So I had to, you know, go through all the hoops of paying the fines and, you know, being held as far as promotion and all that. And, uh, uh, you know, two, a week later, I get a DUI. So November 5th, 1986 is my last drink. Um, on that day, just like I'm standing here, it was one of those experiences that, you know, I know from the inside of my, my being that there was a power greater than myself keeping me there to face the consequences of what I was up against. Because I, I, I had the habit and the reputation of always running from facing consequences. I always ran. And that night, I wanted to run because I knew what, was, what I was up against. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. And if I ran, you know, then, you know, I could make up some lie or whatever, but it still would have been consequences. But my, my whole being wanted to run, and something kept me there. And I know today it's a power greater than myself that I didn't understand at that moment. Um, I, I blew into the, the tube, and, you know, the guy said, you, you're drunk. DUI and uh, you got to get your base commander to come and get you and I got arrested and my base commander had to come and get me and bail me out and um, from that day uh, until today I haven't had a drink um, and that's a gift that's a gift of sobriety that's a gift of this way of life and uh, you know I, I don't take credit for that in the sense that um, you know, this God that I didn't understand when I got here or what kept me at that, you know, from running that day, I've gotten a relationship with that, that God, that power greater than myself. And uh, as a result of the steps. Um, I had an experience. I was in here. I, I got sober November 5th, 1986. I went to a family reunion in June of 87. It was the first time that I remember all five of us kids ever being together. 
So I went back home and, and participated in that. And in that time that I was there and participating in that, I went down to Garland, Texas to visit, visit my best friend. And when I got there, I landed in Dallas and he picked me up from the airport and he was my drinking buddy and we did a lot of other stuff together. And uh, he's, we went to the liquor store and he said, how much alcohol do, do we need? And I said, I don't drink anymore. I was like, oh, man, that was a big deal for me. You know, it's like, I'm going to stand up for myself. And right then and there, I knew, you know, God had me protected from that. But when he got to his house, you know, this little baggie that he pulled out, I didn't have any effective mental defense against that. And I participated and smoked some stuff that I, I shouldn't have smoked. And uh, I remember going back to England and somebody challenged me on that. And they said, were you sober and clean? And I said, no. So I changed my sobriety date. It's July 1st, 1987. Um, and that's something I had to do. And, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, I always want to look outside of me for validation. You know, if you tell me what to do, then guess what? I got somebody to blame. You know, and I called people all over and I said, you know, we're talking from November 5th, 1986 to July 1st. That's a lot of time of being sober. I got to change, you know, and I, I call people all over. California, you know. Ohio, Georgia, Tennessee, you know, what are you going to, what would you do? And here was the theme. And this is my theme for tonight's talk is to thine own self be true. That's what they kept telling me. To thine own self be true. And it's like, dang, you know, because I always want you to tell me what to do so I can blame you if it doesn't go right. And you can't argue with to thine own self be true. I mean, how can you debate that? You just got to either accept it and uh, nobody told me to change my sobriety date. So, I went back to my meeting and, and told them what I did and made amends for, you know, what I did. And uh, I've been free ever since. You know, and a lot of people, that's one of those things. You know, I can't tell anybody what to do in here. Um, anybody asleep yet? <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, where I got uh, sober in England, you know, the speaker meetings were an hour long. And, uh, you know, we didn't have all these meetings. You know, there was one meeting on the base. And if you were lucky, you know, you got to go outside the base and, you know, take a bus because I lost my, my driving privileges. But I had one meeting a week. And uh, after I got a foundation laid and I went through treatment, um, I started another meeting on the base. So we had two meetings on the base. But, man, this area is infiltrated with meetings. And... You know, it's, it's a gift, but then it can also be a curse because, you know, what I've discovered for me, um, you know, and what I was taught early on was that page 17, when it talks about the meetings themselves will not hold us together. You know, we got to have this fellowship of the spirit. We got to have this way of life that gives the newcomer hope because the meetings ain't going to keep me sober. I mean, I can go to 10 meetings a day and it ain't going to work for me. If I don't have a solution, if I don't have a relationship with this God. So, you know, I was, I was fortunate to get into the book from the very beginning. And what I was challenged to do was to look at this and this way of life as if my head was underground. You know, I'm not underground, but underwater. Um, what, the only thing I want then is water or air. Um, and so I've, I've gone after it that way. I take my sobriety very serious. I take the process very serious. And, uh, um, you know, but it's been a gift. You know, it, it's like, you know, she, she came up with a big smile and just happy, you know. And that's what, what this thing is really all about, is having, being happy, joyous, and free. You know, it's not about sitting around and feeling <clears throat> sorry for myself, because I did that when I drank. And I didn't know how to deal with it. And, and then, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I come in here and I had all that stuff. And I remember early on, you know, I went to a meeting off the base and, uh, you know, this guy named George, I'll never forget his name because, uh, you know, again, I had a couple months and I wanted to let everybody know how spiritual I was and, <laughs> and uh, you know, the solution that I had. And, and I remember talking about somebody in the meeting and he stopped me and he said, uh, Brian, we do not character assassinate people in the meetings. It's like, whoa, you know, I didn't like that, you know, because that's something I was used to. You know, I always assassinated people. I always took everybody's inventory. 
So it was a powerful lesson for me from then on. Uh, my first sponsor that I had in here, uh, he had 15 years and he went back out. Um, you know, this ain't a game in here. It ain't. I, I uh, just met with somebody that had 19 years today. You know, that had 19 years and now he's got three days. Um, I know somebody that had 30 years. He's, they have 70 some days now. Another person I met last night had 16 years and uh, got, you know, some prescriptions prescribed. And, you know, we don't take them as prescribed. We, you know, take them because, you know, we we stub our toe and it's, you know, it's to the extreme. We need a tourniquet, not, you know, an ibuprofen. So, you know, and, and these messages that I get on a daily basis or, you know, whenever they come to me, I see them. And it's like we got to be on guard. All the time. All the time. And, uh, you know, some of those messages that we get in here are, are, are priceless if we just listen and watch. Um, so the work, you know, I had to admit I was powerless over alcohol and my life was unmanageable. Uh, you know, that that's a surrender that I don't know how to do other than know that alcohol was my great persuader. You know, when I sit out there and I drank I didn't never I never drank enough and I knew that and uh, when I stopped blaming people and accepted responsibility for my life that's when I understood what it meant to be unmanageable you know I'm not a victim I'm a person that blames everybody and that's why I'm a victim because I don't want to take responsibility for my life and uh, I had to learn that early on because uh, in the Air Force you know, when you do the things that I did, like DUI and, and punch an officer, you got to pay consequences. And, you know, as a result of this process and going through treatment and doing the steps and making amends, um, you know, the Air Force looked at that and, and they reduced my year-long sentence that I had for not driving. They allowed me to get my license three months early. Um, I got my clearance back to work in a top-secret environment in the Air Force early as a result of this way of life. Um, my, uh, my commander that sentenced me to treatment and all those hoops that I had to jump through, I had dinner at his house with his wife when I left that base. That's a result of Alcoholics Anonymous in this process, not me. That's because of this way of life that I had. Um, ended up getting married over there and have two beautiful kids today. You know, both of my kids were born in England. That's a gift of sobriety. You know, being sober. Up till today, my children have never seen me drink. That's a gift of this program, a way, this way of life. Am I still a jerk? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I have this thing that I always want to do everything to the best of my ability, and I, we call that perfectionism. And I wanted my kids to sidestep all those issues that I had when I was growing up. But guess what? <laughs> they had to go down their own rabbit trails. And that's a tough thing for a parent. You know, if you're a parent, you know. You know, I got a son that I would take a bullet for who has three DUIs. He's 25 years old. And those happened when he was 18. You know, he's paying the consequences. But, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. I'm here. Um, you know, I've had to sit, you know, on the other side of that plate glass window and look at my son and say, I won't bail you out. You know, I mean, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. And boohooing? He was boohooing, but I boohooed out in the car because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a strong, tough dad, and I don't want him to see my, my, my soft side. Um, you know, I, my daughter, you know, a needle in her arm. You know, she had a spiritual experience one day, and her life turned around, and she is just knocking this, this life out of the world, out of the park. Um, she just got accepted to the Citadel for a master's program. You know, but she had to go down her path. You know, I remember going to, um, uh, I got a call from the police department. Your daughter has been picked up. Uh, and I go there, it's like, woof. She's handcuffed in the back of the car and she was shoplifting. You know, she didn't have to shoplift, but I mean, talk about anger. <laughs> it's like, that was embarrassing. Um, 
and, and I got her in the car and I said, why do you do that? And she said, there's a, a rush to that. There's something about it, just like I do with alcohol, that rush that I get from that stuff. Um, she gets that. But, you know, those are some of the things that I've had to walk through. You know, and I, I've, I've been able to stay sober. Um, you know, divorce. You know, married and divorced twice. You know, I'm not the guy to talk about relationships with. I promise. You know, I... Uh, I, you know, it's just one of those things, you know. Um, things change, you know, and I have to accept that in here. But as a result of the process, um, I'm able to stay sober and be able to enjoy my life today. I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I got sober in England. I was stationed in Texas for a few years and then went to Georgia and lived there for 18, 19 years. And then moved out here three years ago. Um, in all of those places, I've had a sponsor. You know, I've, I've been connected in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if anybody's had to move in here, but that's probably one of the biggest things that, you know, for me, you know, if I want to, I want to be accepted, I want to be liked, I don't want to have to reach out and say, hey, I need you, but you don't need, may not need me. I don't want to be vulnerable. You know, and in here, if you're not vulnerable and being stretched, you might want to look at that. And, uh, you know, it's just been my experience that I got to be growing in this thing. Um, and what I did, you know, 25 years ago, that's an experience I had then. I can't even describe the events that happened adequately. You know, I try to look at last week and try to tell you what a great life I have, and I can't even do that from last week. And you want me to tell you about 25 years ago? All I know is I walked through this, this way of life and... Uh, have had experiences that, you know, some have blown the top of my head off and think, how does a guy who was raised on welfare, who is just, you know, kind of meandering through life, get to experience this? Um, one of my most powerful spiritual experiences, you know, and I know the day that I, I uh, surrendered to the fact that I didn't, I didn't run, you know, my human instinct, was when I watched my daughter be born. That's one of my most powerful spiritual experiences that I've ever had. And that's, you know, that's, I mean, how do you explain that? How do you put that into words? Um, and I said I had two children and I was able to adopt my son, my, my, ex, my ex-wife now. She was married before and I got to adopt him. You know, that's the result of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, um, yeah. If I had to talk about one step um, they're all important I promise you got to do them in order and my experience has been I do the steps on a regular basis and it's never done me wrong um, it's never kind of you know I look back and I think that was a waste of time but I've, I've learned from the beginning that the third step you know that decision it, it says made a decision it doesn't say anything about you know doing anything it just said made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. And the decision is to do four through nine. To take the action. And I had to learn that in here and remember that um, if I've made a commitment to this way of life and I've made a commitment to this God that I don't understand and I've made a commitment to you guys, I need to follow through with the action to be able to say that, you know, I, there is a way of life that you can't stay clean and sober no matter what happens. Um, no matter what happens. You know, I lost my mom. I don't know if anybody has your mom or lost your mom, but, you know, that's, that's a huge deal. You know, I've been sober a long time, and, you know, as a result of this process, I was able to take care of her at the end of her life. She suffered from dementia, and, you know, for 14 months, you know, I was able to take care of her. Um, you know, so that commitment that I made in the third step, you know, my keystone has always been in place. I know that. But I go back through the steps because it allows me to get closer to the God of my understanding and to be free with you and to be also, you know, more uh, aware of the things that I do on a regular basis. Call them habits, call them shortcomings, defects, I don't care what you call them. Idiosyncrasies, things that I do that, guess what? The meeting should run this way and only this way. You, know, you should always smile. If you're not smiling, then you must be unhappy. So I need to make you smile somehow. 
That's my job. You know, and I think the third step tells me, guess what? I got to quit being the director. I'm the actor who ends up trying to be the director who ends up being the producer of yours confusion and my confusion. You know, it's just, that's the way it is. Because I don't know what you need to do. I don't know what anybody needs to do in here. I know what I need to do. I need to uh, continue to walk down this path and reach out my hand. And anybody that asks me to, to help them, I say yes. And one thing that I've learned in here is, um, is, uh, and I, I don't, I don't mean this in any other way. I have, you know, years of experience. But most people, you, they ask you to to walk down the path with them. You take them as far as they want to go. Mm -hmm. And most people don't get to the fifth step. Most people don't. You know, if somebody gets to the fifth step, it's like, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. <laughs> wow, you know, you got some foundation. Let's go, you got to move forward now. But most people, they want to just go to meetings. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that commitment. And I take the commitment very serious. And uh, there's a lot of fun in here. And it's not about the dances. It's not about all the outside stuff. It's about being at peace with myself and being free. To be able to be who I am. You know, go into a room and not have to be anybody else. Or, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, whether you like me or not. It's just, I'm me. You know, and me is okay. And I can help people in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, just like anybody in here can help people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me to sponsor them, and uh, a small percentage actually finish the nine step amends that they're aware of, a small percentage. Um, and the people that do that, when they go through the process and they finish their amends, their lives are just, it's, like, it's remarkable what happens in here, I promise. Share a couple of experiences. Um, this guy named Josh, he took a hammer to police officers. Not a smart thing to do, right? He was in a hospital for a few few weeks. Yeah, they didn't they didn't like that. Um, he should have been in prison. He shouldn't have the life that he has today. But as a result of this way of life, you know, he's got two children. He adopted his wife's other two kids. He's married. He's a foreman at a uh, pretty big construction company in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Josh. And he's got a tattoo on the side of his neck. And I don't know if anybody knows anything about tattoos, but there's a hammer and a pick. Um, and it's a significant meaning, you know, and he's got something on the back of his thigh. And uh, this guy, when he came in, he, he didn't hold hands. No, uh-uh, <laughs> we don't hold hands. I'm going to stand here. You just leave me the hell alone. And... You know, and as far as, uh, you know, look around this room, you know, there's not any, uh, uh, you know, minorities or whatever they are. Um, he wouldn't, he hated people. I mean, there was, there was just hate in this guy. And today, it doesn't matter who comes in that door. He's the first one to greet him and say, hey, what can I do to help you? Doesn't matter the color. Doesn't matter where you came from. I don't know too many people that have, you know, gone out there and dumpster dived. Um, there's people that I know that have done that, and today they have dignity and they can hold their head up and say, as a result of this process, this is what happened and this is why I'm here today. So my mom, you know, what a, what a model for me, what a role model for me. Came in here on welfare. I don't know if anybody knows about that, but there's five kids and on welfare, living in the inner core, only white family in the inner core in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's not a good place to be. And uh, she made it. She died with dignity and respect and uh, as a result of this process. You know, she moved back to, uh, to Georgia um, and, uh, you know, just a free spirit. And I remember one day I was out at Red Clay Park and I'm riding my mountain bike and she's out there with one of her sponsees. You know, she was coming to Georgia just to visit and she stayed there about five months. And she had a lady that she was working with. You know, it's just this thing about giving it away. Um, and that's the gift of sponsoring people. You know, if we give this thing away, you know, we get to keep 
whatever it is that we, we have. Um, and that's a challenge. I don't know if anybody likes sponsoring in here. Uh, it's always uh, an interesting experience. Because um, you want them to have it. I mean, I want everybody to be successful and have this thing, but it's just a matter of where does willingness come from? You know, if, uh, if I wasn't beaten by alcohol, I'm probably not going to have the willingness. I'm probably not going to have the willingness. Um, and I know for me, I was beaten by alcohol. I was powerless over alcohol. So the willingness came from being powerless and knowing that I couldn't do this thing on my own. So, I don't know. You know, this... Uh, this way of life is remarkable. Um, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, you know, if, if you want to read some good portions of the big book, read 83 through 88. No, 89 actually. And there's like 48 promises in there. Maybe 50. I don't know. There's a lot. And, and what we get in here, you know, this, uh, this way of life that we have. Um, I think the stories are important to me. All the stories in the big book, not just the first 164 pages in the beginning part. I think the whole book is important. Uh, so, I got one more minute. Anybody got a joke? Uh, you know, I, it's you know, I, I this thing is is so serious to me. And I promise you, if we were to talk outside of the meeting, it would be very serious. I would take it very serious, and I'd share my experience with you, not my opinion. I don't have an opinion in here. I'd share my experience. And, uh, but it is life and death, guys. It is. I went on a 12-step call with a friend of ours, Jason Brown. And the guy's name was Dale. And uh, he hung around here for a little while. And he, um, he got a few years. And then he was in the hospital. And, you know, Jason came to me and he said, uh, there's my alarm. He said to me, uh, yeah, I'm going to pick up a, a chip or a 12-step call. And I said, man, do go, go on the 12-step call. I promise. The chip, forget the chip. <laughs> so uh, we went on a 12-step call, and that guy was laying in the hospital bed wishing he had what we had. He was, he was desperate. But he had gotten to the point where alcohol, you know, alcohol overeating, alcohol won out. And he was laying on his deathbed, and he had all those things hooked up to his body, and his organs started shutting down. He was younger than I was, younger than Jason, too. But he looked like he was 70. Anyways, uh, we were going to go back two days later. And uh, he died. From drinking too much. That's what we're up against, people. And people that have long-term sobriety, you know, if we, if we don't stay close to this thing, we forget that we're alcoholic. Mm -hmm. It's waiting. And you see it all the time, guys. I promise. There's such a gap between five years and 15 you ever, and I know a lot of meetings in this area, but think about it. You know, people get their lives back. They get the relationship. They get the house. They get the job. They get the car. They get the whatever. And they forget the gift of being sober. And I'm going to shut up now. <laughs>